uh, we've, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it just started recording. Okay, so I, I want to thank you guys for having me today. And uh, what I thought I'd do is just put together, uh, I put together grand rounds on developing an academic career. Um, I, I kind of like the title, an accident waiting to happen or a methodical road to success. And what I've done is try to call through the literature and look at predictors of uh, academic success. And then uh, towards the last part of the talk to just speak about the uh, program that we here, have here at MUSC and update you on our results. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to go through some definitions, predictors of success, and what we view as mentorship, and then our institutional data on individual development plans and what we're going to be doing in the future. Next. And so, uh, if you could hit the next slide, yeah. So, we, we here have a, sort of three tracks, and, and the clinician educator track is, oh, if you could go back one, please, um, is... I think you scrolled ahead, thank you. Carries a heavy clinical load, develops excellence in teaching, develops a reputation as a master clinician and does scholarly activity, including publishing through requirements, though the requirements are less stringent, and then has scholarly activity geared towards activities that promote teaching. So scholarly activity in teaching. Um, and then if you could go to the next slide, we also have an academic clinician track and that carries some clinical load, but really expected to perform high quality clinical research and grant funded, and then does scholarly activity and publishes, uh, and those publication requirements are greater, and has a reputation as an excellent clinician and presents at national and international meetings. If you go to the next slide, our third track is sort of a basic investigator, really has almost no clinical load, if any. Um, expect to perform high quality bench research and develop independent grant funding. Those scholarly activity and publishes and those uh, publication uh, requirements are greater and also presents at national meetings. We go to the next slide, please. What's kind of common to all, and, and one of the things we've seen in terms of promotion and tenure is um, they have to perform some intramural committee work. Um, they have to mentor if they're gonna be at least at the professor level. They've attained excellence as an educator and contributed to course development, and they're networked at local and national professional organizations. And, and the, it really kind of begs this question that I've been sort of trying to answer, um, are we still looking for triple threat faculty, that is faculty that are great uh, investigators, great teachers, and great clinicians? And I, and I think the answer is, you know, I think those days are kind of over, and, and, and really what we're seeing more and more now is people who have two but not three of those, uh, uh, three of those qualities. Um, next slide. So there are other definitions. What does tenure mean? Tenure mean it's on a trajectory which allows a faculty member to obtain tenure. And, and the definition I took right out of the dictionary, which is the right to keep a job, uh, especially a job as a professor, for as long as you want to have it. And at our institution, that actually only means $90,000 worth of support. They've actually monetized that here. And we do have a post-tenure review committee that can revoke tenure, so it really is not as long as you want it. Um, the other definition I think that's germane is an up or out, and that's a failure to advance in rank over a given period of time, usually seven years, um, results in non-renewal of a contract. And we certainly see that. We are not an up and out institution. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the, the next question is, are there really predictors of success in academia? And I can tell you the literature is not great here, although we think we've, I, I think I've kind of gotten some logistic regression analysis from survey research of different faculties on what is predictors of success. If you go to the next slide. Um, and this is a, one of the first papers you'll find. It's actually 1977 Mich Michigan uh, Department of Medicine set up a two-track system, and they, and they they looked at resources, expectations, salary structure, and they were strictly defined, and they evaluated it 12 years after the implementation uh, of the first 83 hires in internal medicine in that two-track system. Next slide. It was kind of weird, though. When you looked at it, it allowed for physicians to move between tracks, so they recruited the faculty. They're either recruited as a physician scholar or a clinician scholar or a full-time clinician, and they could either be in a research tract or a scientist tract, and they could move between these two leadership or emeritus faculty. If you go to the next slide. 
And what they found, if you looked at the physician uh, scientist track, clinician scholar track, and the uh, full-time track was the way they set them up is uh, if, if you were in one of the first two tracks, you only had about 20% of the time uh, in teaching and 80% in the, in the physician scientist track and about 30% in the clinician scholar track and almost no time to do uh, research in the clinician track. And patient care went from zero to 50 to 95 between those three tracks. Um, what was very interesting was their annual salary guarantee as a percentage of their total salary was 50% if they were a bench scientist, I mean, excuse me, 100%, 50% if they were a clinician scholar, and only 25% if they were a full-time uh, clinician. Uh, and they had a lot of incentive salary if they were in the sort of off-site clinician uh, uh, realm. Next slide, please. One of the things they found was that people in the, uh, in the physician scientists uh, track were promoted in an average of 4.3 years and departed uh, in about 3.8 years. If you look at their teaching excellence scores, and one being the most excellent, clinician scholars uh, were better teachers in general. What was interesting to note is that the, the people who left faculty, the seven people and the 23 people who departed in the physician scientists, or in the, the physician uh, clinician scholars track were actually equally good teachers as the people who stayed. Um, the publication track record, if you look at the publication track record, what you see is that the people who were promoted tended to publish more um, and uh, the people who departed tended to publish less. Although if you look at the people who departed in the clinician scholar track, they had a pretty good publication track record. What was also apparent was the people who stayed tended to have extramural funding uh, at a much higher rate than the, than the people who left. So if you go to the next slide. So 30% of their 83 faculty departed. And, and this is something I, I just want to alert people at, at, at your program about. You know, I've been trying to get a, a I think the biggest challenge facing academic medicine, certainly facing the Department of Medicine at our institution, is faculty retention. If you look at all the papers I'm going to review, about 25 to 30 percent of the faculty leave. And when you look at, uh, at what that costs in terms of a, a monetary cost, about 5 percent of the operating budget of a medical school faculty, of, med, of, a, of an academic health center, is replacing faculty that leave. Um, equal percentage were promoted, though on average, it took two years longer in the clinician scientist track as opposed to the basic scientist track. All that were promoted had funding, and none that departed uh, had an R01. Transfer occurred mostly from the scientist track to the clinician scholar track. Teaching scores were very similar. And they actually concluded that the two-track system was, was successful. I kind of think if 30% of your faculty leave, and if it takes two years longer to promote clinician scientists, I'm not so sure I would draw the same conclusions. Next slide, please. Um, this is a survey uh, done at Medical College of Virginia, which is now VCU. And one of the things it looks at, and I pulled this out to look at predictors of success, one being the amount of protective time you have. And this, they've split their gr groups into two groups, one that had less than 50% clinical care and one that had greater greater than 50% clinical care. And you can see um, that the averages were significantly below and significantly above 70% uh, when you looked at, 50% uh, when you looked at those two groups. Next slide, please. And there were some interesting things here. Uh, group two, again, that's the heavily clinical group. Uh, more women were in group two. Uh, more full professors were in group one. Time to, for academic work was significantly higher in the patient, people who did less than 50% clinical time. And if you look at that as a number of hours per month, significant, three times more uh, hours per month. In terms of slower career progress, uh, adequate resources, having a mentor, and meeting with a mentor, all of those were much more likely to occur if you had less than 50% uh, time, uh, clinical time and you were more on a protected track. What I thought was quite interesting was being advised about promotion and tenure was uh, much more common in, in people who had protected time as opposed to people who didn't. Um, and understanding promotion criteria was actually a lot more common in those who had protected time. And by the way, 
promotion criteria is an independent, understanding promotion criteria is an independent predictor of advancement. Sort of like if you don't understand the game, if you if you go out to play tennis and you don't understand the rules of tennis, you're not likely to win the game. Same occurs with promotion. So meeting with a mentor, being advised about promotion and understand promotion, are all important aspects that are seen in people who spend less than 50% of their time with patients. Um, next slide, please. Only 32% of the group uh, two, which is the high clinical load group, uh, felt extremely committed to academic medicine as opposed to 70% in group one. This is gonna come up in our own institution because actually 70% of our faculty are in this group two. Um, multiple logistic regression analysis associated with a high commitment include being a professor, that shouldn't surprise anyone, having tenure, being male, which comes up over and over again, you're much more likely to be successful if you're a male and spending less than 50% time in clinical practice. Next slide. So other predictors, time, uh, average of, if, if group two had an average of four hours per week devoted to academic pursuits, identification of mentor, meeting with mentor, being advised about promotion and understanding promotion. I've already covered that, so I'll, I'll skip this slide and go to the next. Um, the authors point out two challenges, and by the way, this is a 15-year-old paper. One is how to invest in career development of clinical faculty in a way that's fiscally responsible but and furthers the mission, and how to change the institutional reward system to better recognize and encourage the contribution of clinical faculty. I think that problem is as true today, if not more so, where more faculty are clinically oriented than they were 15 years ago. Next slide. So now, uh, now fast forward to four years later. This is a very interesting paper from Hopkins. Hopkins is a single track system, uh, which, which, which goes on, to, and they talk about their system, saying it actually gives them lots of flexibility. But um, what, the, what the faculty basically said was, you know, it might be a single track system, but let's see how people are doing in, if we were to have them self-assign what their tracks are. Next slide. And so what they did was they, they got a 69% uh, response rate, which is highly, highly responsive among physicians, self-described four career paths. One that was a basic researcher, 50% funded, clinician researcher, 50% funded, academic clinician, 70 to 90% clinical, and teaching clinician greater than 50% clinical. So more administration of teaching. Next slide, please. And, you know, Hopkins actually said, you know, multiple track system promotes elite system. That's why they wanted a single track system. Tracking faculty limits opportunities for careers to evolve over time. Specific criteria constrain the ability for the promotions and tenure committee to recognize creativity and innovation. And there's a paucity of valid ways to evaluate methods for teaching and clinical practice so that it decreases the rigor of promotions process. And in 1985, they found no difference between clinical and research faculty in terms of promotion or publication rate. So that's what they said before this survey. Next slide is, um, you know, basically uh, what you see here is that if you're an academic clinician, your odds ratio of being promoted uh, and uh, was much higher if you were a, an academic clinician and much lower if you were, uh, you know, a, a I'm sorry, was extremely high if you were a basic researcher. An academic clinician, remember, has more than 50% clinical workload, was much, much lower uh, in there. Uh, same thing of odds of being satisfied, much higher if you were a basic researcher or a clinical researcher as opposed to being an academic clinician or a teaching clinician. Next slide, please. And other independent factors uh, of making a higher rank, men were three times more likely to be advanced at Hopkins than women, and higher global satisfaction, you were two times more likely to attain a higher rank. So in the summary, the differences exist in promotion and in satisfaction, and in my view, a single track system has not eliminated a sense of elitism. In fact, I think it's furthered it, um, because the only people that seem to get promoted in that track were uh, the scientists with funding uh, that were less than 50% clinical. Next slide, please. Um, so this is met mentorship and productivity and promotion among academic hospitalists. So now we're fast forwarding to uh, a fairly recent study. I, I wanna say this is 2013. Next slide, please. 
It's a web-based survey of 420 hospitalists, which is a really new sort of subspecialty in medicine. Good response rate. The majority were young, actually. And, and what's interesting here is only 42% had a mentor and 44% had never presented at a national meeting. And 51% of those had never authored a, a first authored manuscript. And these are academic hospitalists. Next slide, please. Factors associated with scholarly activity here included being male, once again, having more protected time and understanding promotion criteria. And you can see that there's a three-fold difference. A negative is a lack of mentorship that comes up again and again. And any non-peer-reviewed publication, I thought this was actually quite interesting. So I've long said that you know, publishing case reports in non-peer-reviewed literature doesn't really help my junior faculty or fellows. Um, and here it actually shows that it, it really it doesn't help them get promoted. Um, and those who advanced to associate were four to six Time, uh, had four to six first authored peer reviewed publications uh, and, and didn't have any non peer reviewed. Next slide, please. Um, and this was an interesting paper of factors in part impacting the departure rates of female and male junior faculty. And this was a longitudinal study published in 2012 uh, in the Journal of Women's Health. Next slide, please. And this was 901 new hires between 99 and 2007. Again, about a, uh, between a, a quarter and a third depart from all the academic faculties. And the hazard ratio for departure was much higher if you were a clinician educator, 1.87, and much higher if you were women than if you were male or had a uh, investigator sort of tag. Um, and what was sort of interesting was in that study, Faculty who had an extension of the, if, if it was an up and out system, but they had an extension of the probationary period was actually protective. And, and, and they go on to explain that, which I thought was very interesting. So, and this was particularly true of women. So women who had uh, asked for uh, extension of the probationary period because, for example, they were out uh, on maternity leave and, and uh, were part-time faculty for home care situations, um, that was actually useful for them and allowed them to then be advanced. Junior faculty on a tenure track were less likely to leave than on the clinician educator track, and women were uh, at risk for leaving irrespective of track. Next, fine. Next slide. So a summary of predictors of academic success included having a designated research track, less than 50% clinical effort or more than 20% protected time, being male, being advised about promotion, understanding promotion, having a mentor, and actually meeting with their mentor. If I were going to put down the top six or seven uh, ways to succeed, it would, it would be all about this single slide. And that's about the best I think I can find in the literature, which is really not the most scientific literature in the world. And we've helped design some of the things in our program based on what we've learned from that literature view. Next slide. Um, so this leads us to this whole mentorship piece. And this was a survey of 289 faculty. Next. And what, this is kind of a, a hard slide to understand. But um, faculty with mentors, a uh, total of 51%, you kind of read it, and, and uh, there's clinical 37%, tenured faculty 69%. And if you look at the uh, sort of clinical faculty meet with a mentor 53% of the time, um, they meet a lot less with their faculty than do uh, people at the assistant professor level. If you look at table two, I thought this was quite interesting. Um, uh, I'm sorry, am I having, is someone asking a question? No, you're okay, it's uh, overhead for the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry. So if, if you look down at the odds ratios for having a mentor, what, what I found very interesting was there's actually differences between departments. And so some departments are very likely to have a mentor and, um, and some departments you're very, really unlikely uh, to have a mentor. Um, most mentors are self-assigned and self-identified, by the way. Um, so you could go to the next slide, please. Um, junior faculty members mentoring relationships and their professional development. Uh, this is a, a, a really kind of cool survey, national survey at 20 medical schools. 
Um, 60% response rate of a lot of surveys. So it was a pretty robust survey and 72% were junior faculty. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. So if you look at junior faculty with mentors, um, their average age was a little bit younger, um, uh, about an equal split of men and women, uh, about an equal split of uh, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian, and that reflects na uh, national and academic uh, 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 race uh, issues. Um, if you look at those uh, in the instructor and the assistant and the associate professor level, what you find immediately is those with mentors uh, are a lot more likely to be uh, at the assistant professor at the assistant and, and uh, at the associate professor level uh, than with I'm sorry than without mentors. Next slide, please. And this um, kind of gets the to the mean rating of institutional professional support for their activities. And you can see that uh, those with a mentor report that they have uh, much more support in terms of research and teaching uh, that, and administrative support than their, their junior faculty without a mentor. So junior faculty with mentors get support from institutionally in terms of research, in terms of teaching, uh, and in terms of uh, administrative support than do their uh, counterparts without a mentor. Next slide, please. Um, what I thought uh, was really interesting was the uh, factors that the 970 uh, faculty member, the percentage of mentors who selected these facts. So now this is the mentor part, not the mentee part. And I think this is a misconception among uh, junior faculty. And they said, look, these are the things that junior faculty should be looked for in a mentor, commitment to an interest in their career, ability to motivate others, and methodologic and research skills. What was really interesting is that uh, senior faculty don't see any you know, real need for power in the department or extensive resources at their disposal uh, as being important. But I think a lot of junior faculty look for mentorship and look at those two things. Hey, maybe I should have my department chair or division chief be my mentor because they have power in, uh, in the institution or resources at their disposal. And, but, but successful mentors don't see that as a need. And I, I agree with that. Next slide, please. Um, there were no differences by gender in terms of perceived quality of mentorship in, in invitations to sit on editorial boards, et cetera, and no differences in any of the major categories if the dyad was male, 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 female, female, male, or female, female, which I thought was interesting. I don't think you have to, I don't think sort of gender should come into effect in terms of those relationships. However, there were some significant uh, gender differences here. More women believed that there, were in, there was inadequate, that inadequate mentorship impeded their growth. And also, male mentees, <laughs> this is just a little bit of a joke, guys. Male mentees were five times more likely to be invited by their mentor to an informal sporting event or some other event than their female counterparts. Um, and I, I have no idea what to make out of that. Next slide, please. So choosing the right mentor, and this was taken from uh, University of Cal San Francisco's uh, Board of Regents in 2012, and it's knowledge and experience, respect in personal skills, good judgment, confident, shares network of contacts and resources, allows protege to develop their own, uh, and demonstrates initiative, takes risks, and shares the credit. And I think sharing the credit's a huge piece of this. And, and then commitment, invests the time and energy and effort into mentoring and shares their personal experiences. Next. Just put a, a list of what it means to be a proactive mentee. And, and we thought, you know, of these things, do I allow myself to be open? Do I, uh, am I receptive to criticism? Will I uh, value constructive feedback? Am I willing to modify my behaviors? Do I follow through on my commitments? Do I make an effort to instill trust? Do I openly show my appreciation to my mentor? Next. So this is some data and now I have from our program and there's the website for our program. You're always welcome to look at that. Next. And so um, this is from 2012. I thought this was really interesting. And this is uh, in 2012, the Department of Medicine, um, 
are you aware that there's a departmental plan? Do you have a formal mentor? You know, it's 96%, 96% said, yeah, we're aware there's a plan. And this was the first year of the program. 93% had they said they had a formal mentor. But interestingly, uh, when we asked them how often you've met uh, in the last year, it, it's a little bit crazy because uh, a bunch of them said we only met uh, two times or less. So, so uh, nearly 50% had only let, had met uh, two times within the academic calendar year, which hardly, in my view, counts as mentorship. Um, and and you know the uh, the folks on the bottom, three to six, six to twelve, was only about a quarter. Uh, uh, you know, to the other half of our faculty. So half of our faculty only met two times or less. And when you look at satisfaction, um, if you weren't uh, aware of a departmental plan, you didn't have a mentor, you were much less satisfied uh, at all with the program. Next. So in 2013, when we really started keeping strong data, we had uh, uh, 130 people at the rank of assistant or associate. Our program is not uh, geared towards full professors. In 2014, you can see we had 151 at that level. Assistant uh, professors dominate at 64%, uh, and our instructor level is lower. Our 2015 data is really consistent, 70% assistant professors and about 25 associate and five, full, uh, five instructors. Excuse me. Next slide, please. If you look at the uh, academic tract, and we have the three-track system, what you find is that you know, despite the fact that I showed you data that says clinician educators uh, really have a tough road to hoe in terms of promotion, satisfaction, willingness to stay at an institution, investing in the academic mission, uh, we have, that's the majority of our faculty. So 70%, 65% or so of our faculty are in that clinician educator track. Next slide, please. This has been a real focus of of, of sort of getting towards my work of, uh, of working on an individual basis with these folks. So if you look at our uh, average years at the current rank, 2013, 14, and now our 15 data, it's, it's really very similar. You're at that rank for about four years at the assistant level and about 3.9 years at the associate level and about a, a year or two at the, um, at the instructor level. Next. So what we thought was interesting is we at, in our what we call our individual development plans we 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 don't make it a requirement it's their drop down menus in a red cap and we ask them to provide us with a goal of uh, you know a goal if you want to and it, it, it says zero you can put zero in there you you don't have to fill anything in if you put that you have one goal in that track clinician te teaching research or leadership then a drop down box will come into play. What's so interesting to me is despite the fact that we have very clear tracks that support either a, a very research heavy load or a very clinician heavy load, everyone feels compelled to put in goals for each of the tracks. So even the clinician educators put in goals, uh, an average of one goal in each of these tracks. The academic investigators, not surprisingly, and uh, academic clinicians do have a higher level of research goals, but they don't shy away from putting in clinical goals and teaching goals in their individual development plan, which I kind of find a bit surprising. Next slide, please. It suggests that people still think they have to be a, a triple threat. So this gets to a question now that we've been really tracking about how much of your goals you're achieving. And so in our academic clinician, academic investigator, and a clinician educator track, we asked them the simple question, you have five choices. I achieved all my goals, more than half, half, less than half, or not successful at treating, achieving any of your goals. One of the things we find is that our academic investigators, so again, these are people with less than 50% uh, or uh, 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 clinical time, they're stating that they're achieving much more of their goals, either all or greater than half in a much higher percentage than our, our clinician uh, educators uh, or our academic clinicians, for that matter, uh, achieving uh, uh, more of their goals. Next slide, please. The value of finding a mentor. We asked them, do you have an, a mentor and how often do you meet with your mentor? 70 of those 130 had an identifiable mentor. The ratio of mentees to mentors was two. So. It brings up another question, which is, do we have enough uh, mentorship around our institution? And the answer I would uh, would state is a resounding no. 
and it's an area where we are uh, really starting to think about how to uh, how to uh, have workshops for mentors. Um, and if you look at the ratio, it's two, but actually we had some people who had nine mentees, and they were listed for nine mentees as the mentor. It's hard for me to imagine you could give good mentorship to nine junior faculty and keep up your own uh, research uh, agenda. Completed, and this we found very interesting, if you completed your IDP, your individual development plan with a mentor, you and achieved more than half of your goals 42% of the time. However, if you had a, you completed your ITP without a mentor, you only achieved your goal 17% of the time. And by the way, that's an incredibly consistent finding over the three, now three years. You're three times more likely to have uh, have achieved your goals if you had an identifiable mentor. And and also, I'm not showing it here, and met with that mentor, uh, you know, more than twice yearly. Next slide. You know, we we looked, we started looking very carefully at uh, at how they written how they've written their goals, and so we've now started to grade their individual development plans by division within our department. Um, and what you know, what, I'm a pulmonologist by training, so you'll see some of that in here. Um, what what we see in green is, uh, you know, the goals tended to be way too broad. I would like to become a world class pulmonologist, and you know. I sit in the office with them and say, well, like, what does that mean, you know? Uh, and then we, we sort of start refining them. In the next three years, I'd like to be a regional referral for patients with interstitial lung disease. And as opposed to, you know, their research goal of develop a funded lab, we, we, we kind of got down to brass tacks. We'd like to submit a K award this year, become a principal investigator on one industry grant related to interstitial lung disease. Then lastly, teach medical students, residents, and fellows. We find that a common theme. And what we said was, well, maybe it would be better if you developed a regional continuing medical education course on the care of patients with interstitial lung disease or develop course curriculum for the students and residents in interstitial lung disease. And what I also would like you to say is that we're encouraging people to have their goals interconnect. So from a research goal uh, to a clinical goal to that feeds into their clinical goals and their teaching goals. So we'd like to see those interrelated. Next slide, please. We, we, we found that their goals don't match their work schedule. So, for example, we uh, they want to be a funded research, but they're currently doing six clinics a week, so six half-day clinics per week. Um, their protected time seemed to be just disjointed, so they'd have, uh, you know, a few months where they had all clinical and then a month of research and then all clinical, so weren't able to, you know, keep at it uh, during their time. Clinician educators actually seem to have no involvement in education. So they weren't responsible for medical student or resident education. They weren't doing scholarly activity in education. And, and we also found that some of the mentors didn't have expertise in what the mentee wanted to accomplish. Next slide. The goals were not actionable uh, or actionable with a timetable behind them. So in three years, be a regional referral for patients with end-stage interstitial lung disease. What we want to see is year one, start a half-day clinic, which only sees patients with interstitial lung disease. And we want a goal of seeing 100 new patients by year two. To Medicaid award this year, become the PI on one industry grant. Assemble a mentoring team in three months, pilot data in six months, draft grant in nine months, submit in 12 months. So we really want to get behind this idea that they had to be actionable and actionable within a time frame. Next slide. And so our, we have one-on-one, -on -one, one hour office hours, um, which we have found to be, the, other than the IDP and feedback from the IDP, the single most successful part of the program has been these one hour office hours where uh, a faculty can come and see me. They, it's all internet based. They go in, they click a time, they get that time, they're set up to see me, they update their IDP before they see me, they update their CV. The first part of the meeting is me reviewing the promotion criteria immediately, reviewing the criteria for uh, uh, looking at their CV and critiquing it, and then going over their career plan. And what we found is that almost all the faculty have high potential, great work ethic, they're passionate, and they, but they seem to be confused about a lot. Career plans are diffuse and not well developed, want to be everything to everyone, know what they want to get somebody where, but they can't say exactly where. 
and the themes are similar and most are correctable and the themes seem to be very similar it doesn't matter what division or department so it doesn't matter if it's cardiology faculty or pulmonary or rheumatology the themes are very similar uh, and the issues seem to be correctable next slide So uh, as a percentage of those who completed an IDP and those who didn't didn't have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring session in the past academic year, they achieved less than half their goals as those who had one of these sessions. So people who did seem, seem to want to meet with us who were much more likely, twice as likely to, to uh, reach half or more of their goals. Next slide. We did a survey and, and we asked a lot of, a number of questions on these with the 70 people. Now we've repeated that survey the second time through um, and the results are exactly the same, which is 100. We asked two important questions in the survey, which is, would, you know, they're kind of marketing things. Would you recommend this to another faculty member? Uh, it's sort of like, would you recommend our product? Just like if you're buying a TV set. and. Uh, would you come again? So would you attend another session with uh, the vice chair and would you recommend this to others? And both of those were 100% yes, which is really highly desirable for the program. All but one understood the promotions process uh, compared to uh, the year before, where again, we showed only 67% uh, understood the promotions criteria if you didn't have one of these sessions. Not sure what that one, no, that one person was thinking because that's the first thing I go over in every single one of these. Next slide. So what helped in achieving their goals? A protected time, good mentorship, frequent conversations with the mentor, strong collaborations. Um, these are direct comments we lifted, uh, you know, necessary resources. Next. What hindered you? The demanding clinical responsibilities, uh, learning the right people to contact with, lack of institutional support, uh, and increasing clinical duties, poor time management. This is somebody's self-assessment and overcommitment to diverse projects. And again, you, you can take these simple comments and look back at the literature and predictors uh, in logistic regression analysis, and they fit every single one of those sort of sort of uh, uh, hindrances that you see in the, in the medical literature. Next. And uh, this just shows you that from 2013 to 20, promote, uh, 2014, we increased the number of people who understood the promotions process. Uh, and then now in 15, it's gone up even more. I didn't show that data. Next. If you had a mentoring session, you were much more likely. And now in 2015, uh, it's almost 100%. Next. So to summarize, faculty development is possible uh, with a commitment from all aspects of the institution. Identifiable predictors for advancement and failure exist. And, and I think we don't really recognize them or codify them or try to address them. Uh, mentorships, critical individual development plans, I think are crucial. I, I, I have to say, I, I wasn't as much a believer when I started the program as I am now, but they have to be focused, actionable, and with time frames, and should be developed and revisited frequently with the mentor and reviewed by the division director, um, and you must understand the promotions process. One of the things we've done, by the way, is we've now incorporated that individual development plan. This is the first year we're doing this into the uh, yearly contract evaluation because one of the things we found is we don't believe division chiefs uh, uh, really knew exactly what their faculty's goals and aspirations were. And so it's bad if there's a disconnect between what the division director expects and what the faculty member wants. And so it, 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 we felt it was important to uh, both have the mentor fill out the uh, uh, IDP with their mentee, and that's now become a requirement, and also that the division director now review that and say, hey, wait a second, maybe I could support, oh, I didn't realize you wanted to do that. How about we help support that endeavor? Uh, or, hey, you know, I hired you for something different. Maybe we need to revisit why I hired you. That This was not part of our hiring plan, and so we should talk about that. Um, and we're hoping that that alignment will make for much higher faculty satisfaction. Next slide. Uh, I think that really, 
ends what I wanted to talk about today, or what I, I hope you guys wanted me to talk about today. Um, and I don't know if that opens us up for time for questions. That does. Thank you very much. That was excellent. So we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, just a reminder to everyone that we are recording. So if you have anything you do not want recorded, just let me know and I will stop the recording. Uh, hi, this is Bill Weintraub. I really in, enjoyed um, uh, your pres presentation. Can you talk a little bit about um, a couple of, of, of issues? One, the role of national mentors uh, as opposed to local mentors. The other thing uh, is the difference between um, um, content mentors and, and personal professional development mentors. Yeah, that's a Bill. That's a tremendous question, and something we've struggled with. I, I, at first, I could give you my own experience, which is uh, I'm a lung cancer pulmonologist and a funded researcher, and um, my mentor has my two mentors have uh, my two content mentors have never been at my home institution. So uh, I've had external mentorship at a time when you did a little bit of letter writing and telephone calling before you know you really everyone was internet savvy. Um, and that was highly successful for me. Um, I, me I would say that I am absolutely committed to getting your mentorship wherever you can. A content area mentorship is a must. Um, what I will tell you is, Bill, we're moving very quickly from a one mentor can fill every role to mentoring teams. And we've particularly done that. I didn't speak about this today. One of the initiatives was that uh, Dr. Rocky, our chair, has tasked me with putting, uh, really focusing on K eligible and K ready people for career development awards. And we have surrounded them with three people on a mentoring team. And so I am not at all opposed to having a sort of work life professional mentor that that's probably at your home institution, a content mentor that may or may not be at home, and, and maybe even a, 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 a third mentor that has uh, expertise or a skill set that you don't necessarily have that might be able to uh, augment your either your grant funding or or anything else. So we're moving very quickly to mentoring teams. I think senior investigators now, uh, because of the uh, competitiveness in the landscape for funding, have less and less and less time to uh, to mentor people properly, if you will, uh, but still want to do it. They're still committed, um, but maybe can't take on the whole role of sort of. Uh, uh, being what we, I think, in the old days called the true mentor. So I, yeah, I, I, very, I agree entirely. I very much agree with the idea of a mentoring team. The other thing, let me ask you also, is when does mentoring stop? You know, do uh, does the full the, the full professor who's hoping to go from a division to a department chair or department chair to uh, to, to dean, um, or is he still being mentored by the by the dean or the uh, the vice president or the or the president president? Yeah. So. That's a great question and also leads to another thought I'd love your input on. So uh, here's what I think. I, I still call my guy. I mean, he's retired. He just retired and I we call and bounce stuff and I bounce stuff off him. We've, we've become, you know, listen, he's a close personal friend. Um, and I would say that I don't think it stops. And I and one of the things we've been finding, just so you know, among our 11 division chiefs, um, I've had people buy into this program lock, stock and barrel. And some people who, honestly, they've been highly successful and believe that they got there all on their own and never had a mentor, if you do talk to them, which is ludicrous to me. I mean, I am guarantee you that if they really thought about it, they had a mentor somewhere along the way. I, I think, actually, a, a, a stronger area that I'm, I'm having a lot of senior faculty come up to me and ask and say, Gerard, when is this program going to start working more with senior faculty on things like succession planning? on retirement, on, you know, those issues. And I have to tell you, I think there's a tremendous need for that sort of thing. And one of the things I'd like to see is some of our professor emeritus here who have been deans and department chairs and still are around campus all the time. I would love to see them take a role with mentoring senior faculty. By the way, me included, how, how can you move into leadership? How can you uh, improve your, uh, your ability uh, to lead? How could you provide succession planning. It's something I don't think we do well as an academic faculty. So yes, I think there's a need. I don't think it ever ends, but I don't know exactly how to tackle that problem. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think that, that that you alone can't tackle that problem. That's sort of a cultural thing that needs to develop within an institution. 
<clears throat> that you could certainly be part of. Uh, as a senior person around here, I certainly think about, uh, about that. I've actually been, besides having my job here at Christiana, I've been uh, I've been um, uh, professor emeritus now at Emory for for ten years. Right. Um, and uh, um, and because I'm I'm still working full time, I haven't been active as professor emeritus. But that's but the, the emeritus faculty is a tremendous pool of of uh, of resource. Um, and um, helping people who are still working full time transition into that and continue to do things that that are useful. But also the key thing is for emeritus faculty, you got to enjoy it every day. No one's going to continue right. on the emeritus faculty unless it's unless they really find great satisfaction in it. Um, so I, I think there there are really tremendous roles in, uh, for people in figuring out how to do that. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Silvestri? Well, I think that is it. Dr. Silvestri, thank you so much for your time. We always learn a lot from you and appreciate your time and effort with the Excel program. So thank you. And yeah, I hope that's awesome. awesome. a great day. Yeah, it was terrific. Thanks so much, Yard. Oh, Bill, no problem. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Good talking to you. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Take care.